Hi, my name is Michelle Kral, and John Sellers asked me to just go ahead and introduce myself. And I particularly wanted to let you know I'm Michelle. In the program, it says Michael, and I didn't want you to all be confused by the dress and the long hair. <laughs> Although, given we have cross-dressing soldiers, I suppose that's appropriate today. <laughs> My first introduction to the works of James Oakes came while as a teaching assistant at the University of California, Berkeley, which is also where Professor Oakes earned his PhD. And I was going to put in a little Cal cheer here for us, but since Berkeley just fell to Maryland in the NCAA basketball the other day, instead of go bears, I'll say bears are gone. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Oakes' second book, Slavery and Freedom, An Interpretation of the Old South, was among the books assigned to students in the undergraduate U.S. History Survey course at Cal. That alone comments on the readability of Professor Oakes's prose and the accessibility of his arguments to a general public. That over a decade later, Slavery and Freedom is still being assigned to undergraduates in the History 7A course at Cal is a testament to the durability of Professor Oakes's work. James Oakes is a professor of history and currently holds the humanities chair at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, having previously taught at Princeton and Northwestern Universities. He earned his PhD at Berkeley in 1981, and in 1982, his dissertation was published as The Ruling Race, A History of American Slaveholders. Dr. Oakes is also the author of numerous articles, review essays, conference presentation and conference presentations on the subjects of American slavery and political liberalism. His most recent work, The Radical and the Republican, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and the Triumph of Anti-Slavery Politics, examined what these two statesmen had to say about each other and how Douglass the reformer and Lincoln the politician eventually came to understand each other about slavery, emancipation, and the limits of the possible during the Civil War. As, Sean Wilentz, as historian Sean Wilentz has commented, the book forcefully explains how radicalism and mainstream party politics converged to overthrow American slavery. In 2007, Professor Oakes explained to talk show host Tavis Smiley why he wrote The Radical and the Republican after spending 25 years studying the institution of slavery. I wrote this book to sort of stop studying slavery, he said. I wanted to write a book about people I liked instead of focusing on stuff I didn't like and on people I didn't particularly like. So this was actually for me a way of staying close to the subject I know and love, but sort of elevating my mood a little. This change, paid, this change of direction paid off in critical acclaim. Historian Eric Foner recently cited this book as one of his three favorite works on Lincoln and Oakes was the co-winner of the 2008 Lincoln Prize, which places him among distinguished company like David Donald, James McPherson, John Hope Franklin, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and Kenneth Stamp, Oakes's mentor at Berkeley. So here to elevate our mood a little and discuss Abraham Lincoln, a person we all like quite a lot, is Professor James Oakes. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here. This is, a, this is still a very new experience for me, being part of a, the, the Lincoln uh, crowd. But it's been one of the great delights of my professional life, and uh, I still can't get over it. I, I, I've been working for a number of years on a history of emancipation. I, I got waylaid by Lincoln, in a sense, uh, along the way, because he's obviously a large part of that story. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is something that, uh, well, I'm a historian. Every time I went into the sources of the Civil War, I kept saying, where did this come from? Where did they start, why did they start arguing about property rights, for example? And, and, and this is a part of that in a sense that it's a, an attempt to explain how Lincoln became uh, Lincoln, uh, the person we know, although there's not much in it about Lincoln during the Civil War itself. The election of Abraham Lincoln is a fixed fact, sighed the New Orleans Bee. His victory, according to the paper, was a catastrophe for the slave states. It was November 8, 1860, two days after the election, and across much of the Deep South, the meaning of the voting returns was beginning to sink in. 
a radical abolitionist, a so-called black Republican, had been elected president of the United States. Go back and read over Lincoln's speeches, another Southern paper urged a few days later. They show conclusively that the president-elect is, quote, a thorough radical abolitionist without exception or qualification. <clears throat> but if secessionists were shocked by the election of a radical, some northern abolitionists feared the opposite, that Lincoln was a conservative and that his election threatened to derail the abolitionist crusade. Don't confuse Republicans with abolitionists, Jarrett Smith warned. Their policy, he predicted, will be very conservative. A British abolitionist, George Thompson, agreed that Lincoln's election put abolitionism in, quote, a new critical and trying position. You now have to grapple with a new doctrine of Republican conservatism. Lincoln probably would have agreed on that point. He went out of his way to prove that he wasn't a radical, that on the contrary, he was a conservative in the strictest sense of the term. Early in 1860, at the Cooper Institute in New York City, Lincoln had posed a rhetorical question to any Southerners who might have been in the audience or who might later read the speech. You say you are conservative, eminently conservative, Lincoln said, while we are revolutionary, destructive, or something of that sort. But what is conservatism, Lincoln asked? Is it not adherence to the old and tried against the new and untried? By that definition, Lincoln insisted, we, the Republicans who oppose the spread of slavery, are the real conservatives. We want nothing more than to put slavery back on the road to ultimate extinction, where the founders themselves put it several generations earlier. It was pro-slavery zealots who would overthrow the, his the legacy of the founders. It was Southern extremists who would institute a new policy, one that would spread slavery nationwide and keep it there forever. The pro-slavery argument, Lincoln said, was the truly radical position in this debate. It's an interesting point Lincoln is making, isn't it? That in upholding the policies of the founding fathers, he and his fellow Republicans were the genuine conservatives in 1860. But was it true? Was the Republican platform on which Lincoln was elected, a platform that pledged to halt the spread of slavery, uh, really conservative as president, Lincoln would preside over the most radical social transformation in all of American history, the violent emancipation of four million slaves, the only thing that comes close to qualifying as a full-scale social revolution in all of our past. Was that an accident, something no reasonable person could have predicted the moment Lincoln was elected? Were those Southern editors just being hysterical when they denounced Lincoln's victory as the triumph of a thorough radical abolitionist? Or did Jared Smith have some good reason to predict a conservative presidency that would undermine rather than advance the cause of abolition? Was Abraham Lincoln the conservative he claimed to be, or the dangerous radical secessionists feared he was? Or are those the wrong questions? After all, what difference does it make if we call Lincoln a radical or a conservative? It's not the label that matters, but Lincoln does matter. So we need to know who he was and what he stood for at the moment he assumed the presidency. Historians like to say that Lincoln grew in office, that the person who assumed the presidency in March of 1861 was not the same man who delivered the remarkable second inaugural address in 1865. But before we can say that Lincoln grew in office, we have to have a clear idea of who Lincoln was at the moment he took office in 1861, and I'm not entirely sure we do. That's why those polarized reactions to his election are so fascinating to me. What was it about Lincoln that caused people to see him in such starkly different terms? I'm going to try to answer that question by dividing Lincoln's early career into two broad phases let's call one conservative and one radical, for lack of better terminology, and suggest how those two phases came together during the secession crisis. Lincoln started out as a conventional conservative Whig. He was later radicalized by the sectional crisis in the 1850s. But when the South seceded in response to his election in November of 1860, the conservative and the radical Lincoln merged into the person who confused so many of his contemporaries the conservative radical who would, on the one hand, uphold the Constitution 
enforce the law, restore the union, but who would do so, on the other hand, by issuing an emancipation proclamation. How did this happen? How did a conservative radical come into being? How did Lincoln become Lincoln? During the 1830s and 1840s, when he served four terms in the Illinois legislature and one term in the US House of Representatives, Lincoln was a proud member of the Whig Party. He gave perfectly ordinary Whig speeches defending banks and railroads and public schools and upward mobility. He expressed the usual Whig fears of mob rule and social disorder. He denounced Andrew Jackson as the, the hero of the common man. And as the electorate widened to include more and more of those common men, Lincoln stuck to, stuck to his Whig guns and advocated laws that would restrict voting and office holding to white men who owned property. In those days, people didn't use terms like liberal and conservative to describe themselves. Jacksonian Democrats looked around and saw a world divided between the aristocrats and the people. Whigs, like Lincoln, hated those kinds of social divisions. They preferred to talk about the harmony of interests that bound all of society together. Lincoln's dislike of social conflict is one of the telltale signs of his Whiggish conservatism. And there are other indications that he saw himself that way. Once, while he was in the Illinois legislature, Lincoln invited opponents, his opponents in the Democratic Party to join him in supporting a banking law based, he said, quote, upon conservative principles. This was standard Whig party doctrine. Whigs saw themselves and were seen by others as the conservative party. It was their opponents, the Jackson Democrats, who were the radicals. At the heart of Lincoln's conservatism lay two great convictions. The first was nationalism, or more specifically, economic nationalism. From his very first sp political speeches, Lincoln was a fervent supporter of strong central banks, protective tariffs, and internal improvements, the railroads, canals, and turnpikes that would help the economy develop. Much of this was old-fashioned, parochial, pork-barrel politics. Lincoln wanted the government to dredge the Sangamon River so that, the, so that his struggling town of New Salem, Illinois, could flourish. But for Whigs like Lincoln, integrating the national economy had a larger political purpose. An extensive transportation network would bind the country together. Protective tariffs would allow northern manufacturing to flourish, providing an outlet for southern cotton and a market for western meat and grains. The three great regions of the country, north, south, and west, would become so interdependent that their national economic interests would override their narrow, divisive, sectional interests. Sectionalism would give way to nationalism. Whigs called this the American system, and its leading advocate, uh, the statesman Lincoln revered above all others, was Henry Clay. And it was this, it was this nationalism that was, as I said, the first of the two main strands of Lincoln conserva Lincoln's conservatism. The second strand was an abiding reverence for the rule of law. If sectional animosities worried nationalists, Whigs like Lincoln and Clay, uh, nationalist Whigs like Lincoln and Clay, social disorder, anarchy, and mob rule positively terrified them. Lincoln made this clear as a young man in his famous 1838 address to the Young Men's Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois. Lincoln called that speech, quote, the perpetuation of our political institutions, and it was prompted by the wave of mob violence that had erupted all across the United States a few years earlier. Allow people to take the law into their own hands, and pretty soon there will be no law left. And thus it goes, Lincoln warned, step by step, till all the walls erected for the defense of the person and property of individuals are trodden down. But, as his title suggests, it wasn't merely the savagery of mob law that disturbed Lincoln, it was the threat mobs posed to American political institutions. People who are unaccustomed to restraints come to look with contempt upon the restraining hand of government, he believed. The victims of mob rule likewise lose their respect for a government that can no longer protect them. And by such means, Lincoln argued, the attachment of the people to their political institutions evaporates. Don't let this happen, Lincoln warned. <clears throat> let reverence for law become the political religion of the nation instead. In Lincoln's mind, the twin pillars of Whig conservatism, nationalism and the rule of law, could never be fully separated. 
He called for a nearly religious commitment to America's political institutions, but the commitment would be sustained by economic policies that would bind Americans to every, of every section together in their shared dependence on the government. It was no wonder that Lincoln had so much contempt for the political romanticism of his opponents, the Jackson Democrats. They were the ones who elevated the unfettered individual above the necessary constraints of society. They were the ones who disdained government and encouraged popular contempt for the courts. In the name of the people, Jacksonians made disgraceful excuses for mobs that lynched blacks, shot abolitionists, and ran newspaper editors out of town. For a devoted Whig like Abraham Lincoln, opposing Jackson meant more than supporting sound banks and protective tariffs. It meant preserving the social order, maintaining national unity, and respecting the rule of law. Here was the basic difference, as Lincoln saw it, between the sound conservatism of the Whigs and the dangerous radicalism of the Democrats. But those traditional distinctions were swept away by the rise of anti-slavery politics in the 1850s. Lincoln's beloved Whig party collapsed, and he cast his lot with a new Republican party devoted to free soil, which in practice meant opposition to slavery's expansion. Unlike the American system, which implicitly accepted slavery as a permanent part of an integrated national economic system, free soil stigmatized slavery as a backward and disturbing element in the nation's economy. For this reason alone, Lincoln's adoption of free soil politics moved him closer to the radicals. For by the new standards of the 1850s, conservative now meant pro-slavery. Lincoln acknowledged this indirectly in 1856 when he fretted over the possible defection of Republicans of, quote, good, uh, from the Republicans of, quote, a good many Whigs of conservative feelings and slight pro-slavery proclivities. The conservatives were now the people with pro-slavery con proclivities. And as far as those conservatives were concerned, Lincoln's strong moral opposition to slavery made him politically suspect. What was the difference, conservatives wondered, between Republicans and abolitionists? Both went around quoting the Declaration of Independence as if the words all men are created equal actually applied to blacks. It's no surprise that pro-slavery conservatives called Lincoln a black Republican. His critics had a point. Think about what the political spectrum looked like in the 1850s. The arch conservatives were the pro-slavery Southerners. The centrists were the Northern Democrats who claimed to be neutral on slavery and border state Whigs who advocated sectional compromise. And on the left, upholding the principle of that slavery was wrong and ought to be treated as such were Lincoln and the Republicans. Lincoln had always hated slavery, but he was also accustomed to thinking of himself as a conservative. Once slavery became the central issue in American politics, however, he suddenly found himself on the opposite end of the political spectrum. And strictly speaking, he didn't have to alter any of his convictions for that to happen. But he did alter his convictions. Lincoln didn't simply look more radical in the 1850s. The fact is that he grew steadily more radical over the course of the decade, especially after 1857. Some of this movement was strategic, politically strategic. In 1854, still a Whig, Lincoln called, in good Whig fashion, for the restoration of the Missouri Compromise Line. That would allow slavery to expand below that line into the Southwest. But then the Whig Party collapsed, and the Republican Party that replaced it called for a complete ban on slavery in all the Western territories. So when Lincoln himself became a Republican, he towed the new party line, abandoned his call for the restoration of the Missouri Compromise, and opposed any further expansion of slavery. Moreover, the Republicans were free soilers. And as I indicated earlier, the free soil had more radical anti-slavery implications than had the Whigs American system. But the most dramatic shift began in 1857 in Lincoln's reaction to the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision. It changed the way Lincoln talked about slavery. And by the time he finished answering the questions raised by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney's shocking decision, Abraham Lincoln had arguably become a radical. The first question that Dred Scott raised was, did the Constitution, quote, expressly affirm a right of property in slaves as the Chief Justice claimed? 
No, said Lincoln, there was no such thing as a constitutional right of property in slaves. Second, was Tawney correct when he ruled that free blacks were not, never had been, and never could be citizens of the United States? No, said Lincoln, free blacks had always been citizens, and as such, they were entitled to the privileges and immunities that the Constitution guaranteed to all citizens. And finally, if the Dred Scott decision was wrongly decided, as Lincoln believed, what could be done about it? When, when it comes to interpreting the Constitution, does the Supreme Court have the final say? No, said Lincoln. The people, through their elected representatives, have the last word. Dred Scott, he said, was a despicable decision. Somebody has to overturn that ruling, and that somebody was Congress. If the Republicans ever get control of the legislative branch, Lincoln declared, they should overrule the Supreme Court. It's not that such things weren't said in the middle of the 19th century. It's that good, conservatism, good conservatives weren't supposed to say them. Any one of Lincoln's three responses to Dred Scott would have been startling in its own right. Taken together, they suggest a remarkable shift toward radicalism on Lincoln's part. And it wasn't only Lincoln's positions on slavery that became more radical. So did his rhetoric. In the late 1850s, Lincoln began to sound like a radical. There was, for example, the notoriously militant House Divided speech that Lincoln delivered at the opening of his 1858 Senate campaign. The speech dismayed his friends as much as it shocked his opponents. In it, Lincoln said that he had created, that, it, that slavery created an irreconcilable conflict between the North and the South. That kind of talk was common enough among abolitionists and anti-slavery radicals. Frederick Douglass, for example, had been saying for years that a titanic struggle between slavery and freedom was coming, and he wasn't the only one. Militant pro-slavery Southerners also said the same thing. Slavery was no longer secure in the Union. There was an irreconcilable conflict between the Northern and Southern ways of life. George Fitzhugh said that, for example. It was that kind of talk that moderates hated. There is no irreconcilable conflict, they said. If there were, there would be no room left for sectional compromise, they warned. That kind of talk will lead us all into a civil war, they cried. So when Lincoln declared in 1858 that, quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand, that a nation cannot sustain itself half slave and half free, that a crisis was coming, he was sounding a theme that smacked of radicalism. Lin Lincoln's invocation, newfound invocation of Thomas Jefferson is another indication of the shift. Today this seems perfectly respectable, but in Lincoln's day, Jefferson was widely viewed as the ideological godfather of the Jacksonian Democrats. As a young Whig politician, Lincoln rarely, if ever, mentioned Jefferson, but he began quoting the Declaration of Independence as soon as he took up anti-slavery politics in 1854, and he started mentioning Jefferson by name with increasing frequency in the late 1850s. All honor to Jefferson, Lincoln declared in 1859, the man who proclaimed, quote, a superior devotion to the personal rights of men holding the rights of property to be secondary. The Republicans favored, quote, both man and the dollar, Lincoln argued, but in cases of conflict, Republicans stood for the man before the dollar. This makes them, this made them the true heirs of Thomas Jefferson in, Jin in Lincoln's eyes. By the time he became pre Lincoln became president, he had endorsed black citizenship, denied that there was a constitutional right of property in slaves, urged popular resistance to the Supreme Court, and invoked Andrew Jackson to do so. He argued that human rights took precedence over property rights, and he hailed Jefferson as his inspiration. He also formulated his first sustained arguments in defense of free labor, at one point declaring that he was glad he lived in a country where white workers were allowed to go on strike. And in the closing years of the decade, Lincoln's rhetoric became aggressively and at times movingly anti-racist. By almost any conceivable measure, Lincoln was becoming a radical in the 1850s. And yet he seemed uncomfortable with his new identity. At the same time that he was moving in a radical direction, Lincoln be was beginning to define his opponents as the real radicals in the debate over slavery. The chief and real purpose of the Republican Party is eminently conservative, Lincoln explained in Columbus, Ohio, in September of 1859. 
It proposes nothing save and except to restore this government to its original tone in regard to this element of slavery. And over the next six months, Lincoln sounded this theme repeatedly in speeches in Kansas, New York, and New England. In each case, Lincoln contrasted his own conservatism with the radicalism of pro-slavery Southerners. You claim you are conservative and we are not, Lincoln said in Leavenworth, Kansas. Excuse me. We deny it. And then for the first time he asked that rhetorical question, what is conservatism? Followed by what was quickly becoming his familiar answer, conservatism, Lincoln said, meant preserving the old against the new. Southern politicians had recently developed an entirely new set of arguments, radical and aggressive arguments in defense of slavery, Lincoln said, whereas Republicans wanted nothing more than to uphold the moderate restrictions on slavery established by the nation's founders. In saying these things, Lincoln was reversing the common usage of his day, toying with the popular understanding of pro-slavery politics as conservatives and anti-slavery politics as radical. And there's reason to believe that Lincoln knew exactly what he was doing. In fact, his claim to conservatism is suspiciously counterintuitive. The more radical Lincoln became, the more conservative he claimed to be. It's as if he were defying us not to take him at face value. It would be tempting to conclude, therefore, that Lincoln was deliberately masking his increasing radicalism with clever arguments designed to make himself appear conservative. That's what many Southerners suspected when Lincoln won the presidential election in 1860, in November of 1860. Don't be fooled, they warned, quote, having vilified and maligned the South through the long canvas, the New, the New Orleans Crescent declared within days of Lincoln's victory, Northern leaders now tell Southerners that they have nothing to fear from, the presidency, from his presidency, that he is in fact, quote, a moderate, kindly tempered, conservative man. Will you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. <laughs> the Richmond Enquirer agreed. The idle canvas prattle about Northern conservatism may now be dismissed. Give the Southerners some credit. There was reason to believe that a radical had been elected president. And yet, through it all, as Lincoln's anti-slavery politics became more and more radical, <coughs> excuse me, an underlying element of conservatism persisted. Whigs were great believers in limits, for example, that individuals and markets alike had to be restrained for the sake of good order. In Lincoln's mind, slavery violated this enduring concept in several ways. It put too few restraints on the power of individual masters, too few limits on the right of property, and too few boundaries on the reach of the market. In this sense, Whig conservatism fed directly into Lincoln's anti-slavery politics. Similarly, his reverence for tradition and his long-standing fear of disorder th echoed through Lincoln's anti-slavery arguments. He was upholding the legacy of the founders. The pro-slavery forces in Kansas had unleashed anarchy on the plains. The Democrats had abandoned the moderate tradition of compromise. So it's not completely accurate to say that Lincoln was simply making his rat masking his radicalism when he claimed that he was the true conservatism, conservative. Just how deeply the conservative vein ran st still within Lincoln's politics became clear almost as soon as he was elected. In the four critical months between his victory and his inauguration, the two great strands of traditional Whig conservatism that I mentioned earlier, nationalism and the rule of law, reemerged as the central themes of his response to the crisis of the Union. Remember that back in 1838, Lincoln had spoken forcefully of what he had called the perpetuation of our political institutions. Shortly after his election, those sentiments filtered back into his, into his rhetoric. The crowds that greeted me on my way to my inauguration were offering their cheers, not for me as an individual, Lincoln said, but, quote, to the institutions of the country and to the perpetuity of the, liberty, of the liberties of the country for which these institutions were made and created. It was a simple matter of respect for the rule of law. The North would neither coerce nor invade the South, Republicans insisted, but it would uphold the Constitution and enforce the law. Lincoln began to use his nationalism also to fire up his audiences in ways that were unusual for him. 
He flattered his listeners for their love of country and promised that as president he would do all he could to save the Union. But it was going to be difficult, he would say. He could not do it alone. Without the support of Democrats and Republicans alike, the Union could not be saved. And will you help me, Lincoln would ask? Can I count on your support? And across the North, audiences roared, roared their approval. This is how it sounded when he spoke to, New, to the New Jersey General Assembly in Trenton on February 21st. Quote, the man does not live who is more devoted to peace than I am, none who would do more to preserve it. Uh, when, a politician, when politicians declare their undying devotion to peace, it's a sure sign that warlike pronouncements are on the way. <laughs> sure enough, the next words out of Lincoln's mouth sounded the call. Nobody loved peace more than he did, he said, but it may be necessary, Lincoln warned, lifting his foot dramatically and stomping the platform, to put the foot down firmly. According to the newspaper account, quote, here the audience broke out into cheers so loud and long that for some moments it was impossible to hear Mr. Lincoln's voice. He continued, and if I do my duty and do right, you will sustain me, will you not? Loud cheers and cries of yes, yes, we will. Never in his life had Lincoln used such rabble-rousing tactics. Never before had he made such a direct appeal to the emotions of his audience. But it would be a mistake to conclude that Lincoln's priorities had changed, that he had suddenly elevated the sanctity of the Union over the evil of slavery. Union and slavery were not a zero-sum game for him. On the contrary, Lincoln had always imagined an ideal Union in which there was no slavery. That's why he was such a great admirer of Daniel Webster's famous reply, second reply to Robert Hayne in their great debate over nullification. Liberty and Union now and forever, one and inseparable. Lincoln's appeal to Union sentiment was never an alternative to anti-slavery, quite the opposite. He used nationalism to unite Northerners in support of a war that was bound to come so long as he refused to compromise on slavery. It was that very composite of conservatism and radicalism, of uncompromising nationalism and unyielding anti-slavery that made Lincoln's inaugural address so disconcerting for so many listeners and readers. Its explicit theme was obedience to the law. Lincoln denounced secession as the essence of anarchy. If the southern states persisted in their illegal course, he as president would have no choice but to fulfill his oath taken in heaven to uphold the Constitution and enforce the law in every state of the Union. But the speech was more than a tub-thumping rally for law and order. The genius of the first inaugural address was the way it cleverly insinuated Lincoln's most radical anti-slavery positions into a speech that was framed as a conservative homily. Lincoln said, for example, that he and every Republican congressman had sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution, including the Fugitive Slave Clause. He quoted the entire clause verbatim. His point was that Southerners had no justification for leaving the Union because neither he nor any Republican lawmaker had ever denied their obligation to uphold the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution. But this was misleading and may even have been disingenuous. The controversy had never been about whether the Fugitive Slave Clause should be enforced, but how it should be enforced, whether the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was the proper way to enforce it. The question in dispute was always, can the northern states guarantee the rights of due process to blacks so that citizens accused of being fugitives would have the opportunity to prove their freedom in northern courts? Southerners said no, northerners said yes. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 had provoked an uproar among anti-slavery northerners precisely because it transferred enforcement from the states to, the, to national commissioners who no longer recognized the due process rights of free blacks accused of being runaway slaves. In the Dred Scott decision of 1857, Tawney tried to settle that dispute once and for all by declaring that blacks were not citizens and were therefore not entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizenship, among them, most importantly, due process. In his inaugural address, Lincoln suggested that he would revise the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 by restoring the due process rights of free blacks. Quote, 
In any law upon the subject, Lincoln said, ought not all the safeguards of liberty known in civilized and humane jurisprudence be introduced? And why should those safeguards be introduced? Because free blacks were citizens. A revised Fugitive Slave Act, Lincoln said, should, quote, provide by law for the enforcement of that clause in the Constitution which guarantees that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the several states, end quote. Lincoln could vow to the heavens that he would enforce the Fugitive Slave Clause, but what shocked Northerners was how he proposed to do it. With the Chief Justice sitting right behind him at his inauguration, Lincoln flatly repudiated the Dred Scott ruling that free blacks were not citizens and argued instead that they were, and that as such they were entitled to the privileges and immunities of citizenship. Lincoln would uphold the Constitution, in other words, as he understood it, not as the secessionists did. He'd made that clear a few months, a few weeks earlier in a speech at Steubenville, Ohio, on his way to the inauguration. All Americans profess their undying devotion to the Constitution, Lincoln said. The sticking point was the starkly different interpretations of the Constitution that prevailed in the North and the South. Quote, the question is as to what the Constitution means, Lincoln said. Specifically, quote, what are the Southerners' rights under the Constitution? And who gets to decide the question? Who shall be the judge, Lincoln asked. Can you think of any other than the voice of the people? And the people had recently spoken. The voters had decided that the Republicans would now get to decide just which rights the Southerners had under the Constitution. This raised the most explosive question of all. Did the Constitution guarantee a right of property in slaves? In the Dred Scott decision, Tawney had said that the, such a guarantee was expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Those two words, expressly affirmed, are critical to understanding what Lincoln was saying and doing in his inaugural address. For two years, he had been quoted, quoting Tawney's words in his denunciations of the Dred Scott decision. There is no such thing as a right of property in slaves, Lincoln kept saying, because no such right is expressly affirmed in the Constitution. In his inaugural address, Lincoln promised yet again to uphold freely and gladly, he said, all the rights the Constitution promised to the Southerners and Northerners alike. He, had he or any other Republican ever actually threatened those rights? Is it true, Lincoln asked? that any right plainly written in the Constitution has been denied. Think, if you can, of a single instance in which a plainly written provision of the Constitution has ever been denied. All the vital rights of minorities and of individuals are so plainly assured them by affirmations in the Constitution that the con controversies never arise concerning them. But questions did arise, Lincoln conceded, over issues on which the Constitution contained no affirmations. Questions such as, quote, shall fugitive slaves be labor, from, shall fugitives from labor be surrendered by national or state authority? The Constitution does not expressly say. May Congress prohibit slavery in the territories? The Constitution does not expressly say. Must Congress protect slavery in the territories? The Constitution does not expressly say, end quote. Lincoln was toying with language again turning Tawney's own words against him. The Chief Justice had declared that Congress could not prohibit slavery in the territories because Congress, the Constitution expressly affirmed a right of property in slaves. But here was Lincoln at his inauguration telling Tawney to his face that Congress could ban slavery in the territories because there was no pride, property right in slaves expressly affirmed in the Constitution. Lincoln's inaugural address Although framed as a traditional defense of the rule of law and the sanctity of the Union, simultaneously reiterated the most radical elements of his anti-slavery politics. When Lincoln, so when Lincoln promised to respect all the rights Southerners were entitled to under the Constitution, he was effectively promising them nothing. It's hardly surprising that secessionists saw little but anti-slavery extremism in Lincoln's speech. Quote, Couched in the cool, unimpassioned language of the fanatic, the Richmond Examiner declared, Mr. Lincoln's inaugural address followed, quote, the promptings of fanaticism even to the dismemberment of the government with the horrors of civil war. Another Virginia paper, the Richmond Dispatch, agreed, 
the inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln, it said, inaugurates civil war. The demon of coercion stands unmasked, the sword is drawn. But when Frederick Douglass read the same speech, he was shocked by its conservatism. We must declare that the address, the address to be little better than our worst fears, Douglass wrote. Some of this was hasty misreading. Lincoln was not, as Douglass believed, affirming the rights of property and slaves. But Douglass also caught the contradictions of Lincoln's speech, even if he didn't quite grasp their full dimensions. Quote, it is, he said, a double-tongued argument capable of two constructions. Just so. The inaugural address was a conservative speech suffused with unrepentant nationalism and an unblinking determination to enforce the law, come what may. But those Southern editors were right as well. Lincoln has, had taken an oath of office spouting dogma that sounded to them like pure abolitionism. Slavery was wrong and ought to be treated as such. There was no constitutional right of property in slaves. Accused fugitives were entitled to the presumption of freedom and with it the privileges and immunities of citizenship. That same paradox of, radical, of conservative radicalism shaped Lincoln's emancipation policy during the war. He would endorse the revolutionary overthrow of slavery and at the very same time he would warn against letting the Civil War, quote, degenerate into a violent and remorseless revolutionary struggle. However the revolution was accomplished, Lincoln insisted it had to be done legally. It was a position that was bound to infuriate Confederates and at the same time confound the most committed radicals. It's no wonder that Lincoln's harshest critics have always preferred to make things easier for themselves by smoothing out his wrinkly contradictions. The secessionists looked at him and scoffed at the idea that he was a conservative, but radicals were often irritated by Lincoln's very real conservatism. They said he was too cautious, too concerned about the border states, too slow to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, too prejudiced to care about the plight of black slaves. No one was more perplexed by Lincoln's record than, and no one worked harder to figure it out than Frederick Douglass. But figure it out he did. And in 1876, at the unveiling of an emancipation monument in Washington, D.C., Douglass explained Lincoln better than anyone else ever had. Few great men, Douglass said, had ever been subjected to fiercer denunciation than Abraham Lincoln. He was, quote, assailed by abolitionists, he was assailed by slaveholders. He was assailed by men who were for peace at any price. He was assailed by those who were for a more vigorous prosecution of the war. He was assailed for not making the war an abolition war. And he was most bitterly attacked for making the war an abolition war. The abolitionists were often harshly critical of Lincoln, Douglas noted. To them, Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent to emancipation. But Lincoln was a statesman, the elected president of the nation at large. Douglas explained, and it was by the standards of the nation at large that he should be judged. Measure him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, and by that standard, Douglas concluded, Abraham Lincoln was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Thank you. time for a few questions. I'm happy to uh, answer them after I wet my throat here. Can you use Michael asked what the what how I in some ways how I reconcile Lincoln's 1858 statement statements to the effect that blacks didn't necessarily have the right to vote to hold office to intermarry with whites with this question of the privileges and immunities of citizenship I think that they are in fact two separate sets of issues that Lincoln in his own mind uh, I don't want to repeat the whole argument of the article I just published but that he had a conception of, of race relations as, as regulated at three distinct levels uh, 
that uh, he believed in absolute equality of natural rights to freedom and the pursuit of happiness. He, he also came over the course of the 1850s tentatively and then increasingly uh, committed to the notion that national citizenship, the privileges and immunities of national citizenship, and that's a vague and difficult term to figure out in the, by the 1850s, but he did suggest that blacks were in, free blacks were citizens and were entitled to those privileges and immunities as citizens, and that they included, at the very least, the rights of due process. At the state level, regulated by state legislatures were a whole series of discriminations and uh, laws that states as democratically elected uh, you know, representatives of the, of the people were constitutionally allowed to impose, like who gets to vote, who gets to serve on jury. That is, a state can't take away your right to a jury trial, but it does get to decide who serves on a jury, for example. Uh, it, states traditionally decide who get, can get married, what age they can get married, who can marry and who can't get married to each other and things like that, and, and things like that. Those were all state regulated decisions by the state legislatures. There's no constitutional issue, there's no natural rights issue for him. And that's why he says during the debates with, Fred, with Stephen Douglas in 1858, that if Stephen Douglas is so concerned about these questions about whether blacks can vote and marry, then don't send him to the Senate, send him to the state legislature and send me to the Senate because, <laughs> because that's where those issues get decided. He was basically sloughing off, I mean it's not just the sloughing off, but he's basically saying the issues of racial equality that we're concerned about that are listed in those speeches and particularly the Charleston debate are state legislated issues not issues of national government. They don't concern citizenship rights, and they don't concern uh, natural rights. Yeah, but Jonathan on the mic. Okay. Uh, if, if this is off the topic, I apologize, and we just go to the next question. But you've taken us up to the inaugural address, right. the first inaugural, inaugural, and um, that leaves us 22 months short of the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. And is there any intellectual development between that time and, say, December 1st, 1862, and the uh, president's report to uh, the Congress. Yes. That's, uh, in, in a way, my talk today was the prelude to a book-length answer to your question, <laughs> which, is, which is that, that emancipation is a, in, in certain ways, in the larger span of historical time, it's a blink, and it happens very quickly. But, but in terms of the Civil War, it's a long, slow process of intellectual, legal, and social development that begins almost immediately after the war starts and doesn't end until months and months after the war ends, after Lincoln is, is already assassinated. And so the short answer to your question is yes, there is a process that continues after his election to the presidency. I don't think, for example, no one, no one could have foreseen the contraband issue, right? That arises, it's the first big emancipation type issue that arises within weeks of Fort Sumter, right? And, and Benjamin Butler says, I don't want to send these refugee slaves back to work on Confederate lines. I'm going to call them contraband of war. Almost immediately, Lincoln calls a special meeting of his cabinet. He tells Montgomery Blair, you know, this raises huge issues if we're going to keep slaves as contraband of war. We got to meet to decide this issue. He meets, they decide the issue, and th his secretary of war that afternoon sends a telegram back to Bar Butler saying, your uh, decision to call them contraband is approved. That's the first, right? And it's very quickly after the war begins, and, and it keeps going all the way through until his re-election and his decision to promote very actively the, uh, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to nail in place uh, emancipation so that it was irrevocable and also to make sure it actually happened in places like Kentucky and Delaware where there had been no emancipation before then. So, so again, it's a long, short answer, but yes. As late as 1858, Lincoln specifically said, I've said it a hundred times, I have no inclination to take it back, that the people of the North should have no inclination to enter the southern states and interfere with slavery. I have said that always. Uh, 
Um, first of all, do you think he was dissembling, and how do you feel this reconciles with your concept of Lincoln as an increasing radical by that time? I think, well, well for example, the argument about, uh, about uh, it, that I, I gave in answer to Michael's question, part of my answer there is that Lincoln, like everybody else, believes in states' rights. He accepts that the Constitution recognizes slavery in the states where it already existed. And there is a long history, I'm just beginning to uncover this, of attempts by uh, a certain group of anti-slavery lawyers and jurists and legal scholars to figure out ways by which the Constitution could be used. Not the Jarrett Smith argument or the Frederick Douglass argument that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document, <laughs> but, but attempts to use the Constitution to get into the southern states. Lincoln picks up some of that and doesn't accept others, others of it. But by the late 1850s, he's not simply saying, we have no intention of interfering in the states where it already exists. What he's saying is, he's also saying, unless you secede, in which case, all bets are off, right? So it comes with this coda that's absolutely critical because his, he's come to believe that the, the constitutional protections that slavery has are not natural rights to property, but they're very specific and delimited and that you forfeit them if you leave the Union. So he, he explicitly threatens he, sa he says, why would you leave the Union and lose all the protection you have right now under this government? So while he does say he has no intention of interfering, he also threatens to interfere if they actually leave the Union. Good answer. Thank you. Uh, just one question. Uh, what is your opinion about President Obama appearing on the Jay Leno show? Professor Oaks, in your speech you said Lincoln in the first inaugural offers no guarantees or no promises to the South. But in the first inaugural, doesn't he also offer his support to the original 13th Amendment that would have written slavery into the Constitution? H how do you justify the two? He would have to change the Constitution. When he says, I'll give you all the rights you have under the Constitution, mm -hmm. he's not promising anything. If you want to change the Constitution, go ahead. He's suspicious that that's going to do any good. He doesn't believe anything at that point. But that would require a change in the Constitution as he currently understands it. Uh, you need to use the mic if you want to ask a question, please. We're being recorded. You have spoken of Lincoln as an individual, but was he not also a party leader? And while questions, the minutiae of rights under the law was largely decided on a state level, wasn't it true that in those states where Republican legislators gained the majority that they were not shy in pushing for equal rights for blacks when they had the, the power to do so? That's true. But, but Lincoln was very careful about uh, never, never coming out to advocate things that went beyond the party platform, right? Because he was a good party person, and he, and, he would, and he warned Ohio Republicans, for example, don't go advocating the, the uh, overthrow of the Fugitive Slave Act, because if you do, you're going to lose all these votes in Illinois, right? But, but he himself didn't like the Fugitive Slave Act. <coughs> So in individual states, when the Republicans took power, you're right. I mean, they put this universal suffrage uh, amendment to the New York Constitution on the ballot in 1860, and most Republicans voted for it, but it got swamped by conservative Republicans and Democratic voters. But yes, when Republicans took control, it was very hard. They, they were in this peculiar position of, how, in order to get anti-slavery politics back into the mainstream, they had to make this argument that race and slavery were two separate issues. We're not going to go around advocating racial equality. We're just going to advocate the abolition of, or at least restrictions on slavery. We're only an anti-slavery party. But the truth is that it's not so easy to separate race from slavery in American <laughs> politics. And there's a, the kind of people who don't like slavery 
tend to be the kind of people who are more sympathetic to equal rights. So even though it's not an official Republican Party position, there is this tendency in the northern states to see more egalitarian legislation when Republicans take over. Yes. We want to issue. I thank you for Professor Oaks for this fine speech. <laughs> We're going to take a break now. We will reassemble at 11 sharp. Thank you.